All right, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the insect pest management session. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Philip Roberts. I'm an extension entomologist located here in Tifton. And today, myself and Dr. Mike Taves, who's a research entomologist here on, on the campus, will be uh, talking about cotton insects. Um, just as a reminder uh, for some of you folks, but we'll have a cotton scout school here in Tifton on June the 8th, and we also have a scout school in Midville on June the 16th. You know, as we're going into 2015, uh, a lot of us are looking to tighten the belt, so to speak, but in terms of insect management, you know, making sure you have a good scout, using good IPM, spraying only when you need to, that's the way we can be most efficient. All right, who in the audience can tell me what this symbol is on the bottom right up here. Anybody recognize that symbol? Can you tell me what it means? Be friendly, protect the honeys. Protect the honeys, be friendly. That is actually called a bee hazard icon, okay? Now, if you look at neonicotinoid insecticide labels right now, Right now, it's on neonicotinoid insecticides, but soon it's probably going to be on most of our insecticides. You'll see a pollinator protection box, okay? And it has a lot of information about trying to minimize any harmful effects using insecticide may have on pollinators. Has anyone heard of issues with pollinators or honeybees on the news ever? Right? So it's a serious deal. And actually, you know, this box is on, on neonicotinoid labels now. I can assure you there are other insecticides more toxic to bees than neonics, okay? But this little hazard or icon is going to be placed on the label anywhere there could be a precautionary statement about bees or perhaps statements concerning directions for use. So it's just raising awareness of allowing you to do a better job you know, protecting these pollinators. This is just off a neonic label. It's actually for uh, thiamethoxam, but I would encourage you to take the time to read this closely. Um, and, and, and it'll show you the seriousness of it. But when you read statements on the label that says, do not apply this product until flowering is complete and all petals have fallen off, that's pretty serious, right? Now, there's some exceptions that allow you to use this product, you know, if there's a threat of loss, crop loss, or thresholds have been exceeded. But I can tell you, if you grow a crop that produces flowers, so you think about crops you grow, but if it has flowers, this pollinator issue affects you. We don't use pollinators on cotton as a service, like watermelons, for example, but there may be pollinators on that crop, but this is a serious issue, and I want you to make you, make you aware of it. Now, with that said, one of the things that, that, that we're trying to do, we've actually, groups in our department in entomology, along with some folks with the Department of Ag, we've actually created a draft of a pollinator protection plan, okay, protecting Georgia pollinators. What this plan is will be a voluntary it's guidelines, but it's voluntary, but it's the, the intent is for us to help promote pollinators and protect pollinators. A lot of it's common sense. But in this document, there will be, you know, recommendations, suggestions for beekeepers. You know, ultimately beekeepers are responsible for, for their own bees, right? But there's also some stuff we can do as pesticide users and applicators. Spraying late in the afternoon versus in the morning, if you have a choice. Bees are most active in the morning. Uh, we're also having information in there for landowners and even urban environments. So we're, we developed this draft plan, sent it out to stakeholder groups, such as the Cotton Commission, our Consultants Association, various other groups. But we had a, a meeting yesterday at Farm Bureau in Macon to get input from all these stakeholder groups. But our goal is to have a pollinator plan that the whole industry, the state of Georgia, really supports. So as soon as we make final edits, we're going to be asking these stakeholder groups for support. 
Now we believe it's important we develop this plan ourselves with input from, from our industry friends, you know, everyone in, involved in agriculture. Because if we don't, guess what? We'll get one done for us. So, so we're being proactive. We're coordinated. We're together on this as a state. So hopefully we, we'll make a difference. Any questions on that? But I tell you, this thing is, uh, it's serious. And uh, if you grow something that produces a flower, you, you need to be aware of this. How many crops do we grow that don't produce flowers, Brian? Not many, some cold crops maybe? That's about it. Huh? They produce them, just not with you. No, yeah, I mean, but. All righty. So today, <clears throat> I want to spend, uh, do something a little different. I'm going to talk to you about a specific trial during my time. I'm going to talk to you about this interaction or potential interaction between thrips management and herbicides, pre emergent herbicides. And sometimes we talk about a lot of different things, but I'm going to talk specifics today because I, I really think this is something we need to understand. But uh, actually, this is part of a regional project where we're working with entomologists from Virginia all the way to Alabama. And we've done this for the last four years. The Cotton Commission and Cotton Incorporated has helped support us with this effort. We really synergize. It went back several years ago. We really coordinated working on stink bugs. That's where we came up with our thresholds, which I've got more confidence in stink bug thresholds on cotton than I do any other thresholds we use. But I'm going to talk to you about uh, thrips management and the use of pre-herbicides. We're all familiar with thrips. Uh, first thing, just to bring up, we need to use a preventive treatment at planting. We see an extremely consistent yield response. I'm getting questions from growers this year. Hey, we're looking to cut corners. We're going to, can we just plant cotton and then just spray it when it comes up? The answer is no. Okay, that's a bad idea. We've got to use something at planting. Treatments we're going to use, for the most part, we're using either imidacloprid or thiamethoxam. These are neonicotinoid insecticides. I asked the first group, using one of these seed treatments, you think that affects pollinators? Does a seed treatment affect a pollinator, potentially? If the dust that comes out of the planter. The dust comes out of the planter, yep. It gets on the it's on the little stuff on the edge, so it can happen. That problem will be fixed in time. There will be improvements in talc, improvements in the coating on the seed. The vacuum planter sucked that stuff yep. off. It yep. but, but we can fix that. I, I wish that was the only problem we had to fix, because there's a bunch of smart folks in that exhibit area, you know. Uh, they could get that fixed. Uh, but anyway, the seed treatments, they're not perfect. We know in certain environments, we need to put a foliar spray on them, okay? When we have heavy thrips pressure, typically on our early planted cotton, we just see such a consistent response to spraying at that first leaf. All right, no doubt palm amaranth changed our production system in Georgia and a lot of other areas, but you know this, but there are, to me, when I look around and drive around in Georgia, we've moved to conventional tillage much more. All right, and one of the things that does with conventional tillage, we see more thrips than we did where we were reduced tillage, but you all know that. The other thing Palmer has, has made us, or the way it's changed our system, is we're using a lot more residual herbicides, both pre-emergent and post-emergent. Hey, we live in a world where we have to, okay? That's not gonna change. We're just trying to see if we need to change things we do in terms of thrips in case we do have stress uh, from a pre-emergent herbicide. And that sometimes happens, right? You've seen it. But when that happens, we see slower seedling growth. The little plant's not growing as fast. And you've heard me say it. That's when thrips can really hurt you. That's when thrips can punish you is if you have a seedling that's not growing fast. Thrips are feeding in that terminal bud, okay, on an unfurled leaf. We're going to put on a new leaf, what, every two and a half, three days, right? So you may have ten thrips feeding on that leaf for three days, and then it opens up. If you're stressed, that same plant may not put on a leaf for every, except every five days or six days. 
Well, you got the same number of thrips, but they're feeding on the same leaf twice as long, right? Twice as much injury. So I think you understand the concept. The other thing it does, so we have greater damage potential on a slow growing plant, but it also extends that time that a seedling is vulnerable to thrips injury. We want to get to the fourth leaf. Good growing conditions, we may be to the fourth leaf in 25 days maybe. I've seen some fields, 40 days, 35 days. You know, so, so there's two ways it could impact thrips management. But we've got to use these pre-emergent herbicides and I want to make sure after you see this data, you think that I'm trying to get you not to use a pre-emergent herbicide, because I'm not. We've got to use pre-emergent herbicides. I quoted a weed scientist some of you know, and, uh, but uh, I, I thought that was a good, good, good quote. But uh, we live in a world of pre-emergent herbicides, and we're going to make them work. So I'm going to talk to you about this individual trial. And... Uh, it was actually conducted in four states, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia, in 2013 and 2014. In these trials, we had three insecticide treatments. We had no insecticide seed treatment. This was like fungicide only as a seed treatment. We had a neonic seed treatment. We used a Victa. Then we had a neonic seed treatment, or a Victa plus orthane at the first leaf. Okay. And that's critical. When we talk about that ore thing, we're spraying the first true leaf. That's what we've learned is in terms of preserving yield, management control very early in that seedling's life is really important. It goes against some of the biases we had at one time, but we've got to have protection early. In this trial, we had no pre-emergent herbicide, a, a standard rate of pre, and then a 2x rate of pre. What we were doing with these herbicide treatments, we used the 2x rate because we wanted to be sure we had some stress from the herbicide. Okay? Sometimes we see stress with the 1x rate, sometimes we don't, but we had this in there because we're trying to do research and demonstrate the concept. Again, if that plant is stressed, we're thinking thrips management is going to be more important. Okay? So we had all these trials. And uh, thrips have kind of done some strange things the last couple of years. They've occurred later than normal, would y'all agree? Some of these trials we actually planted early, trying to make sure we have thrips, and we missed them because we were too early. We didn't miss them in Georgia, but I just want to make that point. But uh, we only had thrips at damaging levels in six of those 11 trials. <coughs> All right. You need to understand how this slide is set up because I'm going to show several slides here in succession. But this group of three bars on the left, these are thrips damage rating. And a damage rating, we just visually estimate damage on a scale of one to five. If that damage rating is above three where I've got the dotted line, I consider that unacceptable. Okay? But on the left, these three bars are damage ratings for the untreated or fungicide only seed. Here's a Victa, and here's a Victa plus a foliar spray of orthene at the first leaf. This is when no pre emergent herbicide was used. The middle set of bars is where 1x pre emerge was used, and the far right is where we had a 2x rate of pre emergence. So as you go right, stress from the herbicide is increasing. Okay? Understand me? Follow me? Well, you haven't mentioned the herbicide. It doesn't matter. It's the concept. So the herbicides vary from state to state. I can tell you we use Prowl and Reflex in Georgia. Okay? But to me, we're not pointing out or calling out a herbicide because we can make stress with anything. But we used what a lot of growers were using at the time. In 2013, that was a standard. If you just look at the damage ratings, untreated versus seed treatment alone versus seed treatment plus orthane, you can see we've got a response. The more aggressive we were on thrips, the lower our damage was in all environments. But here's what's interesting, and this is just the averages from these six trials. Where we didn't use a pre-emerge, 
the C treatment, the damage rating is actually below that three. It's acceptable. A little bit of stress from the, it's above. You see that? Where we had the standard rate of pre, we needed that foliar spray to drop it to an acceptable level of control. Now we, where we really hurt ourselves with injury, we couldn't keep, I mean the plants just weren't growing and thrips was punishing us. But again, it's interesting, it's, it, even, you can look at this a lot of ways, if you just look at our most aggressive thrips treatment, as that stress from the herbicide increased, our damage from thrips increased. You see it? But that's just on how the plant looks. You know, I always say, well what really matters is yield, right? So here's actually the yield data from those trials, and this is from all six trials. And again, you see the same general trend. The more aggressive we were from thrips, we tended to, to increase yields, okay? But I, I think I can present this data in a little different way that makes it easier to understand. But, but one of the things I'm most interested in, if you just compare it to the blue bar to the red bar, the red bar is the seed treatment alone, the blue bar is untreated. In all those environments, we need to use something at planting. And if anybody's considering not doing anything at planting, we got to do that. But I'm most interested in is where do we really see the bang from that orthane spray? Where is it most important? Where we had no stress from the herbicide, what did we add? About 40 pounds? 1x rate of pre, a little more stress, we added about 90 pounds. Where we really stressed it, we added 200 pounds. You with me? Yeah. That plant's not growing right. What's that telling you? Make sure you're monitoring these thrips, and if you got a problem, treat them. I mean, that's clear as mud. That's clearer than mud. Um, so another way to look at this, though, just so you can really, really grasp it, this is that same yield data, but I'm showing the percent increase in yield to the untreated when we use a seed treatment or a seed treatment plus acetate. Again, I'm showing the same data, but you're seeing the difference, the va extra value the seed treatment brings, I mean the foliar spray brought to the seed treatment. So again, that's looking at all six of them locations. So let's just look at Georgia data, just to really, I mean, sometimes you want to see what happens at home. And I'm going to show you something from 2014, and some of y'all saw this. It's pretty eye-opening. But again, where we have very little, we have no stress from the pre-emergence, we really don't see a lot of advantage to that ore thing. But as we get out here, we had hardly any herbicide injury in 2013. So but where we had some herbicide injury, we tend to see that thrip spray becoming more important. This is the 2014 data. This was amazing to me. Where we had no herbicide injury, very little benefit. Where we had some 20% some injury, you can see that orthene spray added another 34%. But what was amazing to me is this cotton was horrible. One orthene spray, look what it did. Actually, the orthene spray in this environment, in this environment, put on almost a bale of cotton. All right. If you got problems, slow growing seedlings, take the time to go, go back and treat it. Now, I've talked about this one leaf spray to a lot of growers, and they say, well, we just can't get back. And that's fine if you can't get back. I want you to know that, hey, if you don't go back, this is what you could be missing. I want you to understand it. So it was much different than the planting dates on that? Or? We were a little later in 14 because it was wet. We planted about the night. I actually went back trying to, trying. To, it's hard to understand this whole deal, this interaction, because the plant, how it responds, it could be the temperatures. But I went and looked at thrips populations. Actually, our thrips were higher in 13 than they were in 14. But uh, seeing how it impacts yield, is, you know, it's, Something that happens so early, and we're measuring it at the end of the year. 
But it's amazing how that one leaf spray is so consistent. It shows up in the basket, not just when you look at it. You just spray it in one leaf. You're not really looking for it. No, nope, but they were there. In both years, we would have had threshold populations if we were scouting. But we're just spraying it for our research purposes. Now, a decision you make as a grower, you know, I would rather see you scout it, but in reality, in a, in a normal year, when you plant cotton before May 10th, conventional tillage, most likely that seed treatment will benefit from a foliar spray. Well, it's cooler, you just have higher thrips numbers. And our data is very, very consistent and clean. Where we're seeing, it's not a huge, but it's about 90 pounds of cotton when, when we spray spray that early planted cotton. What about orthene as a seed treatment? Orthene as a seed treatment is an option. Uh, it's not going to have much residual activity. It absolutely will need to be treated foliarly. But as a seed treatment, you're going to get about seven days. So you would have to drop in there for sure, you know, without looking. You it's no better than the other seed No, no, no. Is any one better than the other? So is there any seed treatment better than the other? Well, you basically have two options. You have imidacloprid and thymethoxam. Both of them are neonicotinoids. In the Mid-South, they are having issues with the resistance, okay? In the Mid-South, the, the more frilled problems are being observed with thiamethoxam and with imidacloprid. All right? So in the state of Georgia, historically, it's been fit for tap. They perform very similar. Last year, we tended to see imidacloprid doing a little better than thiamethoxam. But again, the same class of chemistry. Now, we began monitoring susceptibility of thrips in Georgia last year to both imidacloprid and thymethoxam. And I can tell you, we have variability in susceptibility. So, I mean, there's, some, there's potential that something's happening. As an entomologist where we are, that's a big deal. Because basically, all we've got left is something like orthane. Hey, look, uh, counter. Yep. Counter, um, counter is active on thrips. We didn't, can't really talk about counter or promote counter. It's labeled for nematodes, you know. But in terms of its activity on thrips, as good, probably better than our seed treatments. But uh, I think it's somewhere in the middle between a seed treatment and tending. I, I don't, you know, we still gaining experience there, but uh, it's not what Timic was. I feel comfortable saying that. Any other questions? That's what I had for you. Was it too early to comment on that? The new one that was that talked about earlier that was, hadn't been approved yet. The vellum total? No. Um, vellum total is a product being developed by Bayer. You may have heard Dr. Kimmerate talking to you about nematode management. But it will be a dual <laughs> use product, basically. But the insecticide component in vellum total is a midocloprid. And imidacloprid is an option in furrow. That's a good treatment. If you're rigged up to spray in furrow, imidacloprid, well, it's a product like a Meyer Pro that with full labeled rate of 9.2 ounces is a pretty good treatment. But that's the active ingredient that's in the vellum total. Now, when we look at imidacloprid in furrow, whether it's in vellum total or whether it's imidacloprid by itself, we see a rate response. I want you to be at the absolute tip top highest label of imidacloprid. Now you may not be able to afford to do that with vellum total. I, I don't know, we don't know a price, but, but we see a consistent rate response and we want to max it out if we can, the imidacloprid. So I don't know, we'll have to do some work of adding imidacloprid to a vellum if we're using a reduced rate. But we want that maximum labeled rate or just F or just activity, but more importantly, extending some residual. Well, you put some other clipper down further. Did y'all do some yield study? Yep. Yep. What, what would you do? They, they, nothing spectacular. I mean, it's there. I mean. Well, I'd like to see treatments with the whole thing. It know? would be close. I don't have but enough. The cotton visually look better yes. early on. Yes, yes, yes. If you did the 
been cloaked in her versus the seed treatment, would you still need to have the fourth in firstly? Don't have enough experience there yet. I wouldn't plan on it. I mean, it could happen, but I don't have enough experience to really say if you're spraying in fur, you, you don't need to spray it. I mean, what we want is, a, and we talk amongst our entomology group, we want we talk about one and done. All right, that's the term we use in our little group, so that when you do something, the day you plant, you're done with the ribs. That's kind of like we used to be, right? We don't have it yet. You know, we're close with a seed treatment with the imidacloprid in furl, but it, it, you know, I don't believe it's, it's, if it was close to being one and done, I'd be telling you to do that, but I'm not. Well, how, how long does a seed treatment should last and how long should the infur imidacloprid last? Yeah. About the same? No, the infur is going to last longer. A seed treatment, you're going to be active for 20 days. What day you plant? Active. That doesn't mean it's providing acceptable control, but active. The infer application is going to be active. I don't know. It depends on the rate. Four, even five weeks. But again, I, there's a difference between active and providing mm -hmm. control. So does it provide extra time? I think control? it does. I think it does, but it's still not going to get you. All right, what about if you went with over spray at two or three leaves and extend it on out a little bit longer? Would you expect well, to see a yield increase in that? This overspray, is, when we're talking this overspray, and maybe I'm, I, I don't push this enough, but the time, being early is important. We've done a lot of work looking at overspray at one and an overspray at three, and, and maybe an overspray at one and three. It's all about number one when you spray that first one. Um, so, I know we'd like to buy time to, to get where our post herbicides coming in. That's, that's the question. I get it and I understand it. But where we are now, for us to see this yield response, it, it might chime in, but it, it's, it's early. But the, wouldn't the metacoprid in fur take care of that? The it should help. It should help. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, listen. Uh, last one. Because Mike, Mike's got to talk. <laughs> no. Glufosinate, we have seen activity on mites. Right. But not on thrips. Okay. Don't know about plant bugs. But on mites, I mean on thrips, it's, it's zero activity. Anybody going to pick up Aldecarb? Who knows? Uh, if I had to offer in a personal opinion, I would say I don't think it'll happen. But, but I don't know the answer to that question. Don't forget. No, on uh, one slide, I hadn't forgotten that you were showing my, my cabal difference. Was that untreated versus real good treatment, or was that just needing another shot of treatment? Or that was treatment? putting orthane on top of a seed treatment where we had herbicide in it. So it was treated. Yeah. So it was yeah. untreated. Yeah. And the, and the loads of what? I'm going to check. 400 pounds versus 900 pounds. Oh, no, we still made good cotton. Yeah. I mean, where, even where we did nothing, I, I think it was probably like, it may have been like 1,800 to 1,400 to 1,100. Okay. So it was still decent cotton. But these are plot yields, you know, little bitty short plots, so we're a little higher than normal. But I can show you that after.